All right, good evening, everyone. I think we've got a few people still joining us. We'll just give it a few seconds. Okay. Good evening. Hey, Sam. Hi, John. So we're going to talk about licensing of non-surgical cosmetic procedures in England. So I think this has been the number one question we've been getting from our customers lately. There's been a lot of confusion, a lot of speculation as to what's happening. So we thought, why don't we do a webinar and try and answer some of those questions? Tell, tell you what we don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, just, just as a quick introduction then for those that don't know, this is, I'm, I'm Sam, I'm the clinical director here at Linton, and this is John, he is the MD at Linton. He is also the secretary of the British Medical Laser Association. And he's also on the clinical advisory board for the JCCP. And of course the JCCP have been very much involved in this, uh, you know, the potential new regulations that are coming into play. So yeah, so I'll give you a grilling, John. Yeah, I know. Well, thanks. Yeah, thank you for for organising this, Sam. And I mean, it's important. It's a bit like I remember when COVID hit, we did a lot of webinars just to transport customers through a difficult time. And whilst this is not in any way uh, of that magnitude, I do think when there is uncertainty with regulation change, it's really good for us to keep people up to date with what we know at the moment. You know, things are unfolding, so you know next few minutes or um you know on this webinar not hours hopefully i was gonna say <laughs> hours but not hours but you know this is all about just keeping people up to date with what we know and what we don't know uh, just to try and avoid uh, confusion and thank you sam for dragging yourself out of the um, bed. <laughs> yeah so sam has currently got covid so I know. I've, do I've dosed myself up on, on Lemsip, so hopefully we can get through it without me sneezing and coughing. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, shall we start off by, um, I guess, giving a little bit of background to uh, the regulatory history? So, John, when, when we both started at Linton many, many moons ago, yes, we, we came in, I guess, I mean, you started before me, obviously, just around the time that well in fact perhaps before when did you start so before the well officially i started as a student earlier but I officially started working 2000 with linton yeah um in terms of actually employed properly um yeah so when um, i started in 2002 there was there, there was a few there were a handful of clinics that were registered by the local authorities wasn't it under, under what was actually the nursing homes act the registered homes act but they didn't seem overly concerned with people doing laser or IPL. Um, and it wasn't until the private and voluntary healthcare regulations came into play in 2001 that they started to take an interest, wasn't it, really, in lasers and, yeah. and IPL. So that was enforced by the National Care Standards Commission, who then changed their name to the Healthcare Commission, who then changed their name again to the Care Quality Commission. Yeah. I just think that's a sign of a company that's really doing well. They have to change their name every, <laughs> the Quango, yeah. every few years. But I mean, we we helped our customers through that, didn't we? And it was it was hard work for some people. Well, care quality, yeah, the Care Quality Commission, of course, regulate hospitals really. So a lot of the the regulatory framework they were using uh, for small clinics related to hospitals beds and people stayed overnight and you know so it was quite onerous at the time I think for small clinics but you know I think the point of telling this story is that lasers have been in and out of regulation for 20 30 years haven't they so this yeah. is not uh, what's happening now with licensing isn't isn't something to be fearful of I think it's our role as a company to make sure we provide our customers with the support they need to, for whatever the regulation will look like going forwards um, as we I did think, back then. I think, we? like you say, it was it 
it was a frustrating time, I think, and I th I'm sure some people here on the call were probably registered at some point under the CQC. But it was mostly frustrating because even though it was a legal requirement to do this, they estimate that only about 20% of clinics who are offering laser or IPL treatments were registered. So I know that our customers were doing things by the book and we were helping them with that, you know, providing them with policies and procedures, but the clinic across the road were getting away scot-free. And, and I think I was saying to you earlier, John, that there was a high, a high profile case where there was a doctor on Harley Street who wasn't registered, got a fine, from the healthcare commission as it was, um, still refused to get registered. Um, so they decided to prosecute him. In turn, he then appointed Sherry Booth, Tony Blair's wife. This is while Tony Blair was prime minister to represent him. And they basically said, if you prosecute me, I will counter sue you for victimization because why are you coming after me when I could give you the names of you know half a dozen clinics within half a mile of me that are also not registered yeah and he had a point didn't he and as a result of that i think as a result of the fact that really it it, it just didn't work terribly well there was a new health and social care act in 2008 and for most people lasers and ipl came out of regulation in 2010 yeah and essentially the care quality commission who were really developed to look after hospitals were overwhelmed with the growing number of, set of aesthetic clinics at the time and they, they were just not resourced well enough to look after them and I think this was their, their way of dropping that you know dropping cosmetic treatments out of regulation wasn't it yeah. back in 2010 so yeah. oh for most people I, well we should say this is for most people in England that there's no regulation yes but that's not true in all of the British Isles so you want to tell yeah. us a bit about the current state of play, John? Yeah, I mean, so so as you say, in England, and we'll talk a bit more about in England in a moment, um, you know, we came out of CQC regulation in 2010. Um, in Wales, um, HIW, so Health in Healthcare Inspector at Wales, they uh, regulate clinics in Wales uh, who use laser and IPL. So we're regularly actually supporting customers. Uh, and, it, and it's not too onerous either, is it? No. It's, it's, you know, you need to have a dbs check you need to have a, a letter from the doctor and and in if you if you're using laser or ipl you need to have a laser protection advisor who comes in and does a risk assessment for you and you need to be using protocols that have been signed off by a registered healthcare professional yeah. but you know that's that's as i say as you know as you mentioned lots of our customers in wales similar in northern ireland you have to undergo this and we can support them through it and it's not too much of a problem is it yeah and i think that's the why i go back to the point that regulation is, is not necessarily a bad thing i find it's in my opinion proportionate and um you know as you can see most of uh gb at the moment how you know a lot of it is regulated so you know it's not an issue we've just got to understand what the regulation requires and uh and then help people deal with it as it as yeah. it comes out i mean scotland's oh, an interesting one isn't it yeah yeah so, only, only doctors and nurses only reg and dentists actually registered healthcare professionals are uh, licensed or registered but anyone else can you know do what yeah. they yes exactly but but then england itself i suppose you know is the yeah is the exception to this in in some respects and that is that um, CQC will regulate some laser treatments, although we, as we were talking earlier, Sam, yeah, I mean, even that now is is not really happening, is it? Certainly, in our experience at our clinic, at the Linton Clinic, we are um, registered, but not really for any of the laser treatments that we do. None of them fall under scope. So we're we're in this crazy situation where, well, basically, CQC is only for healthcare professionals anyway. So if you're a therapist and you know most of our clinicians are therapists um it doesn't matter you can do what you want but we do have a dermatologist and a, a nurse that come into the clinic and they do offer some treatments that fall into under scope it's things like botox for hyperhidrosis and migraines and things like that but the laser treatments cqc just not interested in so <laughs> if if our dermatologist wants to remove a skin lesion 
with a scalpel, then that would fall under scope. But if she does it with our CO2 laser, then that doesn't. I mean, yeah. it seems crazy to yeah. me. But So um, essentially, yeah, CQC are not interested in the moment interested in laser, 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 well. laser, laser yeah. treatments, in, in the current framework anyway. Um, and therefore, there is not really any um, overarching regulation in England, other than this odd, odd thing that London, Nottingham and parts of South Essex have a licensing position, don't they, for laser and IPL? Very similar to, I think, how a tattoo studio gets licensed, actually, through the local authority. It's your treatment's licence, it's called, yeah. yeah. And, and um, so this licence is given to aesthetic clinics currently. If you want to use laser IPL, you have to get a licence if you operate in those areas. Or just if you want to do massage and a whole host of beauty treatments you need the special treatments license it and again it varies from borough to borough so, so it's, it's not consistent but often they'll require an lpa and some boroughs want to see that you have a level four that, that you have a specific qualification in laser on ipl yeah but it's a bit inconsistent isn't it that's the point yeah. and i think that's where you know the new re regulatory framework should offer some security and consistency across the whole country i hope now this is a good document and i i reference it here because some of those inspectors that are licensing clinics in london for example um there isn't a clear framework for them to license against and hence why there's a bit of inconsistency and to me this is the best document that's in existence in the vacuum that we currently have in the in England, where there is no overarching framework, the there is a document that's produced um, or, or currently on the BMLA web, website, you can download it from the B, BMLA website, it's called the essential standards, and it offers laser clinics, a sort of uh, set of standards of, of what the BMLA and others in the industry believe is um you know a, a, a way that we can uh deliver high quality safe treatments so in the absence of regulation this is great guidance for well, well this is this is absolutely what they're using in in wales and in the london boroughs you know they're, they're basing uh you know their requirements from of this document really aren't they yeah absolutely so yeah so it's well worth looking at and we cannot say this, but uh, you know what? This is a proportionate, in my view, a proportionate set of guidance that would be great if we could all reference to government as a, as a, a you know, this would be fantastic if the government were to take a document like this and say this is a sort of expectation we have for people to uh, obtain licences uh, through the, the new scheme. Now, now, pure speculation, but possibly a document you could reference if you are. Um, responding to the government's consultation. Yeah, absolutely. So a bit about the actual consultation, really. And, and I suppose from where we were in 2010, when we got deregulated, um, I recall, you know, the, oh, you might remember the Keogh review, where Bruce Keogh looked at the um, aesthetic or cosmetic industry, uh, following the PIP uh, breast implant yes, scandal, yeah. actually. And he recommended at the time a whole host of stuff, but essentially, I mean, he was famous for saying that, that, that the cosmetic industry was like the Wild West, you know, completely unregulated. I have to say that a big focus for some of the recommendations he produced, uh, in my opinion, are based around injectables, so Botox and fillers particularly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And some work that spun out of that, he also recommended a framework for training. And you and I both contributed to the um, Health Education England project, which was run. So, you know, recommendation was there should be a framework for people to get qualified and trained to use laser and IPL and other things. And Sam and I, along with the British Medical Laser Association, contributed to creating that framework, which was published by Health Education England, the NHS, essentially. But within all of that work, there was one recommendation, and that was that uh, there should be uh, a regulated framework for, for people to register in England for doing cosmetic treatments. And for many years then, that lay 
as a recommendation, but nothing really happened until more recently. And um, there was a, a bill, the health and care bill, and that was amended uh, in 2022, and then went through Parliament and all the usual stuff and it received royal, royal assent, which essentially means the bill becomes an act uh, and it becomes the law. And that was passed in April last year. So a new law essentially, or an amendment to the, the bill became law that there would be a licensing scheme uh, for cosmetic procedures in England. And in a nutshell, there were two aspects to that licensing scheme. One was that practitioners would require, require a license and that any premises where these treatments were offered would also require a license. So I guess fact number one, Sam, out of all the speculation, that this is this is fact. It is law now. It will happen. Yeah. Uh, and, and it will be for practitioners and premises. Correct. We know that is to, is true. Right. This is what we know. <laughs> yes. We know that the personal license, you'll have to show that you have good character. <laughs> How you'll do yeah, that. that maybe, maybe that will be a DBS check. That's so that's the case in, in Wales and Northern Ireland. You'll be suitably trained and qualified. Again, we'll come on to what that means later on. At no point, we should point out, though, at no point are they saying you have to be a doctor or a nurse or even a qualified beauty therapist for this. So, you know, they're not saying that, but you will have to be suitably trained and evidence that somehow. And another key part is that it you will have to be insured. Now, I'm sure you know, everyone that uses Linton equipment is not, is insured already, but it's not a statutory requirement to be insured. Yeah. With regards to the premises, you'll have to show that it just meets certain uh, standards for hygiene and, and uh, health and safety, basically. So it's just worth reiterating, isn't it, Sam, that we know there are going to be two licenses, practitioner license, premises license, we know that a license for a practitioner will be built around these, these facts, particularly suitably qualified, whatever that means. And we're not sure what a premises license looks like yet. And that is all we actually know at this stage in relation to, to those two licenses. Uh, so whatever people hear, whatever people say, that's speculation at the moment. This, this, is, this is all we really know. We, we also know, I guess, that certain procedures are going to be covered and and this is what it says it says in the act itself does it john i think this is this is lifted from the actual uh, act itself so that the actual document just just a definition of what a cosmetic procedure means uh, according to the government um and it also shows and captures here uh, the actual treatments that they define in the act itself it doesn't mean this these are the only things but these are the ones that are defined and so, you, you know, the top of the list, injection of the substance, Botox, you know, fillers, for example. And actually, bottom of the list, you know, application of light, you know, electricity, cold heat. Um, so we're in there. You know, it is in black and white. It is the law. The application of light, whether that be laser, IPL, or LED, will be captured. The needles into the skin. I mean, I don't, I don't think there's a single product that Linton supply really <laughs> that doesn't it's fall into yeah. this scope so you know heat radio frequency um the high foo all ev everything is, is under here as well as all the laser and IPL stuff yeah um so we know that that's another another fact about another fact, exactly who will enforce it so we so we know that this is going to be done at government local government level that's about as much as we know. <laughs> it is. Yeah, so, so we understand that these sorts of organisations will be responsible for enforcing this. Not clear exactly how that is going to work. I don't, you know, it's not that we're, that I'm not clear, I mean, I'm not clear, but I don't think anyone is clear on that. I think there are engagements now with various organisations. I do know in the past we've worked with health and safety executive yeah. you know, for various licensing things. So. We've done training for environmental health officers as well in the in the East Midlands area. Yeah, yeah, so, that's true. yeah. BMLA and yourself, Sam, have trained various environmental officers on how to inspect laser clinics or what to look for. So, 
So you can see how this will function. You can see that these organizations will be heavily involved with administering this on the ground. But as yet, it's unclear how exactly that's going to work. And there's an awful lot of groundwork that's going to have to be done for them to be ready to deal with the, just the sheer volume, I think, you know, certainly yeah. if it happens. Yeah, they're not ready yet. Yeah. So I guess it's worth flagging that the reason why we're doing this webinar right now is because a few weeks ago, a consultation procedure was launched. Yeah. It ends at the end of next month, 28th of October. And, and it's asking the following questions at the moment. So it's asking, should there be age restrictions? Which treatments should fall within scope of the licensing scheme? And who should be allowed to do these treatments? Yeah. They put forward a, a tiered, a kind of traffic light scheme of, of different, um, uh, different procedures. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's the overarching, if, if you log on to the, life, the, uh, the consultation, uh, and at the end, we'll, we'll give more information about how you can do that. And you sort of read through the whole document and there's opportunity then they ask questions which we'll go through in a moment but the overarching part of the consultation at the moment appears to be this idea of a tiered system for treatments and they've created this traffic light system the government have created this and they define what green amber red means so what sort of requirements you would have to have if you're in you know for each treatment and then they define which treatments fall in which which actual category. So I think that's well worth us, us running through now. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so so the green one, they, they're suggesting that anyone can do this if they have a license. So this, so this is all, you still have to have a license for this, you and the premises that you're working from. So I've highlighted the um, procedures that, that you can do with Linton equipment in this. So microneedling, IPL and LED, that's all IPL treatments. Okay, that falls under here. Superficial chemical peels, such as you might do with the tri-fruit acid if you're doing a lunifacial, for example. Um, Non-ablative laser hair removal, well, all laser hair removal should be non-ablative, but laser hair removal falls under this. And photo rejuvenation. Okay, so that's sun damage, a bit of collagen stimulation, those kind of things. Yeah. So, so at the moment, just to reiterate, this is in the consultation from the government, they're proposing this um, and they're saying, what do you think of it? Uh, and this is saying that anything in this category, any of the treatments you see on the screen now, the proposal is that any practitioner can do them and provided you have the license. What does that mean? We don't yet know, but that's, that's essentially what they're saying. As opposed to AMBER, where there are some sort of restrictions on who or how they might be delivered. And what they are suggesting is that you can only do these at amber treatments if there is clinical oversight from a named registered healthcare professional. Okay, what clinical oversight involves? That's a million dollar question. <laughs> it's so, a million dollar question. So we think it's unlikely to mean a doctor has to be in the room with you or in the clinic when you're doing these treatments. Yeah, I mean, it's really yeah so this is to me this is the, the you know one of the major uh points of the consultation that that you know people need to be aware of we are really unclear it is not defined what clinical oversight means in fact within the consultation itself they the government are saying that clinical oversight is yet to be defined and it will depend actually on uh, what sort of qualifications people might need and they they say that within the consultation itself what, I mean, what, what clinical oversight means in Wales and Northern Ireland and in the London boroughs and Nottingham is that you are using protocols that have been approved by a registered healthcare professional. Yeah. So at the moment, if you, if you use any Linton laser or IPL devices, we can provide you with protocols that have been signed off by an expert medical practitioner and that and that that works well you know that's been fine isn't it and if we need to get those for radio frequency and haifu and you know that's absolutely fine we can do that so if that's what clinical oversight means i think as you say that's proportionate that's doable yeah. and sensible i think 
Yeah, because, yeah, I have absolutely no problem with that. I mean, so again, we shouldn't be too concerned about what this means at this stage, because we just don't know. Um, and as you said, Sam, you know, in one situation, clinical oversight may be, you know, simply that we you use a protocol, you follow a protocol that's approved by somebody who is a registered healthcare professional, for example. I mean, if we if we have a look at some of these treatments, so obviously Botox and fillers, we know that that they're trying to really cut down on people doing those without clinical oversight and without, especially for prescription medications, you know, they, they want a prescriber to be involved, even if they're not administering, but certainly doing a proper face-to-face -face consultation. But, you know, radio frequency treatments, I mean, it, that just seems a, such a diverse range of treatments. It seems a bit mad to have the treatments that you would do with our three juve or with a Promax, which are very gentle, very low risk treatments, seems you know seems a bit yeah. odd to have them in the amber category. Yeah, so it's probably worth pointing out, and again, this is why I urge everybody uh, to go and register and look at this consultation and submit um, uh, their their answers to the consultation or their their thoughts, and we'll talk about that at the end of of, of tonight, but. You need to look at this because, in my opinion, this isn't quite right. You know, radio frequency, as an example, is a very, very broad category for, for lots of different levels of treatment. And ideally, we'd separate those, you know, into mon monopole or multipole radio frequency treatments, for example. So I think we need to help uh, the government understand a little bit more about what we do and how things are done in our sector. Because when you look at the traffic light system, um, I think it needs some work. So, yeah, I mean, another example is, um, you know, non-ablative lasers, excluding photo rejuvenation and hair, laser hair removal. So that really would be vascular and pigment. Uh, so we can treat vessels with our IPL. That, that seems to be OK under the green tier, but we couldn't treat vessels with our ND YAG laser, for example. You know, so again, that seems a bit a bit odd. Another one here that, that, that needs more clarification is about the combination of two different technologies in a hybrid device. Yeah. Is this platform systems or is it systems where both technologies are being delivered simultaneously? I think it's probably. Yeah. So uh, our reading of this at least at this stage, and you know, we can ask for clarity during the consultation process, but is that the hybrid device looks to be, you know, based on the example they've given, something where two technologies are simultaneously delivered during the treatment itself. So I don't imagine, uh, you know, the X-Lite, one of our IPL systems that has two different hand pieces you plug on independently, you would never use them simultaneously, you'd use one or the other in separate treatments. I don't think that would class as a hybrid device. Um, but potentially the Focus Dual, you know, because it delivers microneedling and radio frequency, that would fall under this category. So more clarity needed there. And I got, uh, just to reiterate, you know, the suggestion here is that everybody can do these treatments. There'll be no restriction on these. Uh, you'd simply need your license, whatever that takes. But there will be some element of clinical oversight potentially for these levels of treatments. And as yet, we just don't know what that means. And then finally, there's the, the red tier. And that is, they're suggesting that only the registered healthcare professionals, doctors, nurses, dentists, in CQC registered premises can do that. And I guess the only ones that really pertain to Linton equipment are um, extensive fully ablative resurfacing, like you would do with a CO2 laser. So I think, I think it's fine to ablate small little skin lesions, but we're saying, you know, complete resurfacing of the face, which, to be honest, is quite an old fashioned treatment now. Anyway, not that many people are doing it. They're usually, you know, doing this fractionally. But then this one's interesting. The provision of any green or amber treatment where the circumstances meet the criteria for the procedure to be classified as a treatment of disease, disorder or injury. Now, what's the definition of disease, disorder or injury is, is acne. A disorder is, you know, hair removal for, for pilonidal sinus or polycystic ovaries or, you know, so. Yeah, yeah, they used to be, didn't they? I mean, CQC years ago would have classed acne as a 
uh, a disease disorder or in, well, it, it injury, is, yeah. you know, and uh, and it used to be a way that people got their clinics registered to use laser in the old days. So, yeah, difficult to know. I think before we move on from here, Sam, maybe we've got there's a couple of questions, and I think some yeah. some will be answered shortly. So one of them is what what do we think the license will cost? I think we're going to come on to that in a moment. Um, someone's asking, can we have a copy of the slides? And yes, we can make these available. Um, and we'll talk more about that Absolutely, at the end. Yeah, we can, we can send... but on this section, interesting, where would tattoo removal fall within this system? If we just scroll back a couple of slides, I think, think it would be. Amber. I think it's a non ablative laser treatment. But it's not photo rejuvenation or laser hair removal. So I agree with you. I think tattoo removal sits on that category there. I mean, it, it's funny you should say that. I mean, actual tattooing, because one of the criteria. From is the insertion of needles into the skin and so there was some debate as to whether tattooing would fall under scope yeah. it looks like they have included uh micro pigmentation so pet semi-permanent makeup but then then they don't intend at the moment to include actual tattooing so. okay so questions <clears throat> when will it come into play <laughs> Well, how long's a piece of string? Um, yeah, I, I, from what I've heard, it's going to be twenty twenty five at the very earliest. Yeah, but as I say, I think it's going to take a long time. This consultation procedure has already been delayed. I think they were hoping to start that sort of July, June, July time. Yeah, I think it's going to take time to ramp up the environmental health officers and you know um, the local government so that they're able to basically just manage this and do the inspections so and i also think that they're going to give people a period of grace as well yeah but even if it comes into play in 2025 i think it's likely that there will be some time after that before you know an absolute cut off yeah so it's worth saying you know we don't know that as a fact that's just our our thoughts but um bear in mind that this consultation at the moment is only the first part of a sequence of consultations from government. So they will be opening up more consultations as time progresses. So, you know, let's imagine they've got a bit of time, they've got to do that, they've got to put everything into place. You can see this taking months or a year or so to, to come to fruition. And as Sam said, if, if you've got to get a license as a practitioner and that license requires you to demonstrate you're qualified or you have a certain qualification which as yet, yet we're not clear on you know thousands of people across the country can't come qualified simultaneously there'll have to be some sort of transitional period so we're fairly confident that the the reality of the situation is the license will take a couple of years really to come to fruition but i have to reiterate that is just our our view of the situation as it stands how much will it cost? So there's no information on that at all. That hasn't been decided. I, I, I think to, to register with the with the Care Quality Commission is around about two thousand, just under two thousand. To get a license to serve alcohol is a few hundred. I'm guessing. I would imagine it's going to be somewhere between those. It's going to be of the order of one or two thousand. But again, that's a complete guess. I'm interested, I've just noticed in the chat, someone's saying that, you know, tattoo artists already need to get a license in a tattoo studio. Yeah. But I don't know how much that would cost somebody. So yeah, Sophia, be, let us know actually, if uh, yeah. how, how much it costs you. Yeah. Uh, Sandra, would Linton provide a statement for us? Yeah, absolutely. We're going to come on to that. That's a good question. Um, will I be inspected? You definitely will be inspected, apparently. I say that this is this is what they're suggesting at the moment. They're, they're saying that they think people will, will be inspected. And if you do not have a license, if you don't comply, the local authorities will have the power to close you down. Yeah. Yeah. So, this is this is the law. This is a law. It's not just some sort of uh, framework. If I'm CQC registered, will I still need a license? Again, on the government and JCCP websites, it said that yes, you will, but they're keen not to duplicate the inspection procedure. So I would imagine that if you get an inspection from CQC, 
that will probably tick a box somewhere that means that you automatically get a license. But again, I'm just, <laughs> this is just speculating. A speculation. And then we've got the million dollar questions at the end. What makes someone suitably trained? Well, I don't, we, we don't know that. Nobody knows that. The government, I don't believe, have actually decided that so yet. So that is work, work, don't know that. work in yeah. progress. Yeah. The only thing I would point to here, uh, and I don't think it's unreasonable to speculate on this, is that um, the government did commission work through the NHS. As I mentioned earlier, um, Health Education England ran a project, both myself, Sam, and the BMLA, and other organisations contributed towards. And we actually worked on the project to create a framework of education and training for um, laser IPL LED. And that's a framework that exists through HEE. It's the framework that people have used subsequently to create the level four hair removal, level five. Right. So, so the, off, the, the off qual regulated qualifications that you can get for VTCT or SIBTAC or sitting guilds or ITEC or whoever, they all follow that don't based they? around that framework now i don't want i want to be very clear there's no nobody has said at government level they're going to use that framework but it is a government it's a document that was produced through the nhs by the government you i would i would hazard a guess that if they were going to look at a framework of, of qualifications for somebody to be suitably trained that's a good starting point so um, again, it's worth referencing if you do submit your, uh, you know, your comments to the consultation, maybe reference if you have got a level four, level five qualification, just to show that that's already in play to the government. And then of course, the other big question is what constitutes clinical supervision? And again, we don't know. There's, there's, there's been no guidance on that. We don't, so. That, that really needs clarification because that's the key bit, really. You know, I'm, I'm quite happy to have laser and IPL in that amber category if it means protocols have been signed off, if it means that you have to be working in a clinic that's doctor-led or nurse-led, then that's just that's just not going to work in, in England, you know. Just, yeah. yeah. Not practical. So... So we can't answer those questions in reality. In fact, every question on this page is at, is, is at the moment still speculation, but I think, you know, there are some sensible thoughts going around that we've just described, but the, the big ones at the end, suitably trained, clinical supervision as yet, but they are still undefined by the government. So the consultation uh, itself, uh, just so that you can sort of prepare your answers in, in advance, um, these are the questions basically that, that they're going to ask you. I, I logged on Sam and went through just a, a process. We've not submitted our, as Linton, we've not submitted our response yet because we're gathering information. Part of tonight is about that. Um, but you can, you can respond as an organisation, which we'll do as Linton, but you can respond as an individual. And it may be as clinic owners, that's what you want to do. And if you do respond as an individual, I noticed there's a question uh, about what uh, relevant qualifications you may already have or are already in the cosmetic sector and so again I'd urge you to comment on the level four level five qualifications for hair tattoo and so on um, because I think the more we can demonstrate to government that these things exist already uh, they are in use not everybody's got them but but they're, they're there that they are in my view proportionate and sensible if we can just if the government can see a pattern emerging from the consultation that people have these or are aware that they exist, then I would hope we can steer people down the right direction for what is a sensible qualification to have to do the treatments. Yeah, other questions that they come on to, Sam? Yeah, to what extent do you agree or disagree that we should set out in regulations that high risk procedures should be restricted to regulated healthcare professionals only. Uh, again, that depends on, on what high risk means, doesn't it? You know, yes. if it is total, you know, a fully ablative resurfacing, then absolutely I agree with that. I wouldn't be doing that, you know, as a, as a non-medical doctor. So um, 
And to what extent do you agree or disagree with the proposal to amend CPC regulations to bring those into scope? Again, I don't have an issue with that. But. Yeah, so I think this links very much to the red section of the uh, consultation. Um, and I think in, on the face of it, you know, I would support what they're saying. I should have mentioned really that the answers they, they want, it's a bit like multi-choice. So each of these questions, you have an option to tick, you know, you strongly agree, agree, disagree, strongly disagree. Uh, and then there's an opportunity to write comments as well. Um, so that's the way that the consultation gets responded to. And I guess this is the bit where I had most comments when I, I responded as an individual. You know, what, do you think that the tier system is sensible? Do you think that there should be any movement between the different tiers? So again, you know, Linton will come up with a our feedback on this, which we'll, we're happy to share. Uh, but but you you may you may disagree with what we say. So you know, we'd urge you to to absolutely go in and and, and fill this out. Yeah. It's really important important that we make our voices heard at this point i think there's no yeah. point you know a year down the line complaining about it if we didn't do anything about it now so yeah i think that's absolutely right sam and i think what we want to do um is, is collate views as well ourselves yeah. i mean this is the final sort of question they ask uh, on the consultation just about age restriction for um people receiving treatments so they are proposing uh or they're asking a question do you think that people uh, under the age of 18 could be treated for cosmetic procedures. Uh, and, and there's a little caveat in there that um, if a healthcare professional decides that the treatment is needed for some sort of medical reason, then obviously they could be treated under, under 18. But, but in all other circumstances, they're suggesting that these treatments should be restricted. Yeah. So again, personally, I support, you know, under 18s not having fillers and botox and things but i but i know that there's plenty of teens that are really benefited from laser hair removal ipl hair removal acne treatments things like that so you know you might have some thoughts on that so <laughs> what next then we're, we're going to continue but john's working very closely with the bmla you've got a meeting tomorrow morning in fact haven't you yeah. Yeah. Um, about so that the BMLA will they'll formulate a response Linton will formulate a response as well um, but we do want to hear your thoughts on this so you know please do email us we've got um, on info at linton.co.uk uh, let us know what you're thinking and we'll take that into account when you know when we're coming up with our response yeah I mean it'd be good for us to we'd like to reflect <coughs> on our customers while our customers feel but we'll come up with a response and I think then we can share that back with people as well so if you're uncertain if you want to respond or you're uncertain what to say we could we'll be happy to share back our um the answers we want to give the comments we will make and again if you then want to use that and reword it into your own words and submit that the, the purpose really being that we we then all reflect the reality on the ground we all say the same sort of message to government and hopefully then that that just guides um the, the consultation process and, and the government's view and how this should end up as a licensing system and just keeps it proportionate keeps it sensible uh, again as a position for me personally i don't think regulation is a bad thing i think it's a good thing it just needs to be proportionate and sensible and that's yeah. what we need to make sure happens this is our opportunity to put our voice across to to government. So I noticed that Jake's popped the link in the chat there. Also, if you've got a smartphone near you, you can scan that QR code. It should take you to the consultation or alternatively just stick in Google cosmetic surgery consultation. <laughs> Excuse me, I nearly got to the end <laughs> without coughing. Yeah. <laughs> um, um, but yeah, if you want to wait and see what Linton say, that's absolutely fine as well. So we can, we can, um, Jake, I'm sure there's a way we can send this out to everyone who's attended uh, our response. So we'll we'll do that. I think we've got a bit of time now for questions. Shall so we have a look? We've got about 15 minutes to just answer these questions. So yeah, people are saying what, what will be the penalties for non-compliance? Again, we don't know that uh, at all at this stage. Well, we'll certainly shut your business down. So... 
okay. stop you doing those treatments. I don't know if they'll be fine. We don't know that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, Sophia, you had a comment about the, the tattooing. Well, so this is for your tattoo license, I guess. They come and visit. They ask for certificates and insurance. Um, there's various health and safety bits. And yours was £600 for premises, £200 for individual. Okay, thanks for sharing that. That's, that's useful to know. I would imagine that it's we're going to be sort of that order of magnitude, a few hundred pounds. But again, is, is anyone's guess? Yeah, it just says it in London currently the license cost for laser and IPL costs about six hundred pounds. So there seems to be right. some sort of consensus there, doesn't there? So, Donny, you haven't heard of any legislation in Scotland? Yeah, it, there is. For in fact, didn't I'm I'm sure that you decided not to um, continue with your registration as a nurse for that for that reasons because it is only if you are a registered nurse or doctor which again seems seems a bit a bit mad but um got a I mean, comment about the different territories um you know is there any chance that scotland and wales are likely to fall into line with the english licensing system i guess is, is the question well, scotland didn't with the the healthcare commission with sorry with the cqc did they so i think no the only thing i would say is i i sit on the, um, a couple of committees for, for the jccp and i am aware that some of the scottish and, and welsh uh, legislators are keeping an eye on this so whether or not they will decide subsequently this is a good thing to roll out uh, but again that's speculation we don't know that at all um, but whether they will or they won't, I don't know. But, but rumour has it that they might be just keeping an eye on how this, this pans out. Will you be able to report non-compliant establishments? So you certainly could with the CQC days. Whether they did anything about it was a different matter. <laughs> they, just, they just didn't have the manpower. Well, they didn't have the manpower to go looking for establishments that weren't registered. But I think they did have a duty if it was reported to them. To look into it so i would imagine that yes you probably can report non-compliant establishments donnie you raise another good point about self-harm scars for under 18s being absolutely vital so again yes that's another treatment where um you know you might not want to say uh that it's only available for adults so so probably worth reiterating that you know, the, the facts of the situation are it is a law now. It is going to be coming. There'll be a license for a practitioner, a license for uh, premises. And there is now a consultation that's open. And the consultation um, is proposing a traffic light system for different treatments. We know laser and IPL is definitely included, along with other treatments like RF. Um, but we have an opportunity now to comment on this traffic light system. And the traffic light system is essentially segregating treatments and just imposing some sort of oversight, clinical oversight, whatever that means, or, or in some extreme cases, actually restricting treatments to just doctors and CQ, or registered healthcare professionals in a CQC setting. So that's as much as we actually know. The rest of what we've discussed is what we believe, what we think, what we are speculating. Um, and I think that's all we can say uh, with any certainty uh, this evening. Mm. But it is important just to reiterate that we would be more than happy to hear people's views, I guess, within the next week to 10 days. That gives us time to collate information. We've got our own views as well, of course, and we're working with other agencies like the BMLA and the JCCP, and we will try and coordinate our responses to government. And we are happy once we've documented that to share that back to our customer base so that you have the opportunity to reflect. If you are in agreement with us, reflect the same sort of um, comments and thoughts back to government as well. Before, uh, sorry, yeah, before before we finish with, uh, I've just noticed another good question from Louise saying, would you recommend working our way towards a level four, five, six of whole qualification right now? I, so that it's a really good question, right? I don't want to say, yes, you absolutely have to do that because you're going to need that. We, we don't need, we don't know that at the moment, but I don't think having the qualification in this is ever going to hurt. You know, it's, it's always going to be something that you've got. It separates you from your competitors anyway. 
it might make things a bit easier when this license comes into play. Um, so yeah, I and but it but you raise a good point that off qual qualification, the off qual approved qualification is really important. So certainly, you know, if you do, I think you probably know that at Linton we do a whole host of qualifications in level four in in hair and skin rejuvenation, microneedling, level five in tattoo removal. For those of you that don't have a beauty qualification, we've actually launched a new, well, or it's coming very shortly, kind of hot off the press this, um, a new access to aesthetics qualification. Um, and that will enable you to then go on and do those higher qualifications in aesthetics. So in lasers and IPL, microneedling, high food, whatever that might be. So I think that is something that is worth considering. But I don't want to say to you, yes, you're absolutely going to need that because we don't know that yet. Yeah. Uh, hang on, let's see if we've got any more questions. Yeah, we will make this recording av uh, available. We'll pop it on YouTube. We'll get copies of the slides out for you. And yeah, we'll do that. And Satsuko, yes, at some point we'll have a high food level four course, hopefully next year. Brilliant. Okay. Last John, we can... no. I think we've covered everything we can. We can... We know, we're, we're, this is as much as we know at the moment, this moment in time, anyway. So, and if anything changes, we'll do we'll do another webinar, and we'll we'll keep you informed. I was just going to say we're on a journey, really. Now, you know, government will have subsequent consultations, and as we go through that journey, we'll keep keep people informed. I think that's uh, you know what we need as as a company. That's what we want to do. That's what we uh, need to do. And that's just to make sure that we present as best we can the facts, uh, explain what we believe may or may not happen, but keep information uh, sensible. So that is what we don't want is lots of confusion and speculation. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks everyone for listening. And okay. uh, yeah. And thank you, Sam, for persevering through with COVID. <laughs> I'll go and have a good cough now. <laughs> right. See you soon. Take care. Bye, Bye everyone.